Hello and welcome to the MMQB NFL Podcast. I'm Gary Bramling. I'm Jenny Brentis. I'm Connor Orr. This was week seven, and it was Sunday, and there were a lot of blowouts, and there were a lot of non-thrilling games, but there were a lot of very happy stories, and uh, we're going to start with one up top here, and then uh, we'll move on. We'll, we'll have some stuff on, on the Chiefs and what's wrong with them. We'll have the uh, uh, the trade chatter around a uh, Texans quarterback, et cetera, et cetera, but Let's start with the formerly relegated to the lightning round, Cincinnati Bengals, who go into Baltimore and, you know, we, we've praised the Ravens very rightly so uh, over the past couple of weeks. But the Bengals just really got the better of the Ravens in Baltimore here. And even on a day when I, I'll start with the offensive side of the ball with with Cincinnati here. I mean, this was a day when Joe Burrow was kind of getting beat up. They they came after him. They knocked him around, and uh, they just ended up just just uh, hanging a couple big plays here on the Ravens uh, in the passing game, and and sort of pulling away here. Yeah, there was that eighty plus yard touchdown to Jamar Chase, and I think you make a great point, Gary, that this was a game where they had to kind of fight it out to open up the margins and they really were able to stick with the Ravens. And then ultimately it wasn't even close at all. I think early in the season, it was hard to know what to make of the Bengals. Even when they were three and one, that included a loss to the bears an overtime win. They had a tight game against the lowly Jaguars. So what were they exactly? But then they hang with the Packers. And this win was really a signature win, if you can have those in the NFL. But biggest margin by which the Bengals have ever beaten Baltimore. And Baltimore was coming off a really big win at the Chargers. They were at home. There were a lot of reasons to favor the Ravens here. But the Bengals just totally dominated. Yeah, it was really, I mean, down to the way that CJ Uzama, I mean, using him as this sort of almost dominant chess piece, that secondary um, receiver that Joe Burrow seems to be finding. Everything about this Bengals team just seems to be firing on all cylinders. Jesse Bates, who going into the season was not arguably, I mean, probably was the best safety in the NFL after the game said, oh, well, you can't ignore us anymore, whatever that was, or, you know, you guys better start taking us seriously now. I think as a player, you're, you you have to say that before the season. You're not allowed to say that when you're five and two. Like you actually have to call that because my guess is a lot of you guys are probably uncertain, like everybody else. Like Jabbar Chase was dropping a lot of balls in camp, and everyone was like, eh, "I don't know how this is going to go." But good for them. And it's weird because this past off season, there was so much like hidden optimism from like. Bengal adjacent people like being like, I think Zach Taylor's got the right pieces here. Like, I think this is actually going to work. And it was so hard to take that even remotely seriously. I mean, I was such a big pro uh, Penny Sewell guy. I thought that the, the pick of chase was just going to be ridiculous, but they've like vanquished all these narratives uh, pretty tidily. And then to hang a 40 burger on Baltimore is, uh, is no small work. I mean, some people were talking about Zach Taylor being one and done after his first year with the Bengals when his number one overall pick quarterback tore his ACL. So people were pretty low on the Bengals, except for the insiders that Connor is talking to, who obviously knew what they were talking about. And I think it's been surprising to see how quickly all the pieces have come together. You know, with Chase, a rookie receiver doesn't, often contribute this quickly that early. And I think we see why they didn't pick an offensive lineman. Obviously they saw Chase as a can't miss prospect and they went with him and were immediately seeing results from that decision. It must be phenomenally difficult. And I give their scouting department a lot of credit. I mean, they have picked some really good receipts. They've found it's been largely that same group of people and the Bengals notoriously have a very small insular scouting department. And I mean, over the course of like 15 years to come away with X number of pretty darn good wide receivers, I mean, kudos to them, but it must be really difficult in college right now to a have identified Jamar chase as the number one in that group and B to understand that what he does is so much better when like a lot of these sec schools are just pounding on, you know, opponents, you know, smaller opponents and feasting on them. And so it's hard to gauge the talent. Like I, it must've been really hard to, to understand why Jamar chase was different or 
that much worth the number one, their number one pick, if, if what I'm saying makes any sense. Yeah, and I think, of course, Joe Burrow can give a recommendation and he knows what it's like. On, he's like on a day-to-day basis. But then you also have to say, well, is he just stumping for his former teammate? It's, it's difficult to separate that out. So even a glowing recommendation might not mean that much. But evidently, they were able to parse out all of the things that Chase does really well and why he could immediately contribute, which again is not easy for a rookie receiver to do. It's becoming a little bit easier lately uh, with the way offenses have changed, but it's still not an easy feat. I still think it was a touch of uh, pleasing your quarterback, making sure he's taken Maybe. care of before you go down the, the that Aaron Rodgers uh, road <laughs> at some point. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, it, the fact that Joe Burrow has returned and really played at a franchise quarterback level is, I mean, that's that's the most encouraging thing you could possibly have for a team. Your young quarterback blossoming, uh, especially after getting his, uh, his knee shredded the previous year. But what they're doing defensively, and look, I think Jesse Bates is right to an extent. I think part of it is because you had those years of Bengals defenses under Marvin Lewis where it was... It was kind of a lot of big names, and obviously it was it was also a lot of guys who sort of had, uh, I don't know, uh, they were people you noticed. You noticed Vontae's perfect, and Adam Jones, and these guys. Like, it was a memorable defense. And then they sort of went through this transition where, uh, you know, Terrell Austin was, was briefly sort of a hot uh, head coaching name, but that defense he, he was overseeing there, it was just like, I don't know, it, it was like... It was too deep. It was too way deep. It, it kind of, it had all the same issues that like Paul Gunther had with the Raiders. Like it was just playing safeties, like, you know, with your heels on the goal line and just no pass rush and just letting teams carve you up. So Lou Anarumo has gotten in there and, you know, what he's done with that unit has just been exceptional. They are not, they're not overly talented. I, I don't think you'd be, uh, you know, blown away by, by sort of the, the athleticism, the talent level they have, but uh, the secondary has suddenly become really good. Uh, you know, they have a guy, and uh, Larry Ogunjobi remains a favorite of mine. Uh, I thought he was a nice find, and he has been absolutely just tremendous this season. They're just, uh, they're just one of those units that's so much better than the sum of their parts, and it's really good. And, and here's what's shocking about the Bengals' defense in particular. Um, uh, two points here. One, that Zach Taylor, remember how notoriously difficult it was for him to get a defensive coordinator? Like mm-hmm. three or four people turned down that job. There was, I think Todd Grantham um, decided he was going to stay um, at Florida. Um, Dom Capers uh, said that he didn't want the job, which like if Dom Capers is turning down the job, like at some point that starts to get scary. But it's this weird year where, you know, these defensive coordinators that, and I think you could say the same thing a little bit about Phil Snow in Carolina, where it was this decidedly unsexy choice and everyone was just kind of wondering, you know, what was going to happen. And they turn out to be really kind of innovative in, in big spots. And this was just a complete um, middle finger to Connor game because not only did the defense play well and Jamar Chase played well, but Trey Hendrickson, who was another person that I lampoon that signing in the off season and he played really well and was actually really great specifically against Lamar Jackson and was one of the few guys that I've actually seen with sort of the backfield agility to be able to get him down. I thought he was a product of that saints defensive line, but um, you know, this is a, uh, this is an FU Connor kind of season so far, you know, and the Bengals are just riding, you know, Chiefs Titans. So, big win for the Titans here. Uh, coming off the Monday night win over Buffalo, they get the win over the Chiefs here, and, and they're just, it's it's really wreaking havoc with people who can't let go of the transitive property because now the Jets are better than both the Bills and the Chiefs <laughs> since the Jets beat the Titans. But uh, we're, and I apologize, Titans fans, we're, we're sort of moving past your team's tremendous success. Uh, it's been a really good run here, and uh, it looks like they are going to control the AFC South. But, uh, Let's talk about the Chiefs and what we think is wrong with the Chiefs. It's a weird mix, right? Because uh, I remember us talking about this on the show uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. And it's, I mean, the defense is terrible, right? The defense is Mm -hmm. atrocious. I think they're 
um, 30th in net yards per attempt surrendered by the pass, 30th um, in net yards per attempt surrendered by the run. Uh, I think 28th in yards surrendered, 28th in points surrendered. I mean, this is this is a bad defense that can get gutted in multiple ways and is is banged up and injured. And um, you know, I think we're just left deciding at this point, like, okay, is this roster? Does it just fall victim to the kind of thing that just that, that tends to happen to good Super Bowl teams where you sort of get fat and happy and you think you can survive on your star power a little bit and then you just you get a little bit of trouble replenishing some of the key and critical positions? I don't know. But, um, you know, and even the offensive line, which a lot of people want to say is this or that, I mean, is good in spots. You know, I think they have two or three good starters right now, which is more than a lot of the league um, can can say. And so... I don't know. It's just a strange situation. They're not running the ball well. Um, Teams are kind of figuring out. I made this analogy, Jenny, um, to the 2010 Jets and the New England Patriots. But, you know, everyone got that idea for slowing down the Patriots by, like, doubling Rob Gronkowski, which was a big thing for a while. And while they're not jamming Tyreek Hill off the line, there is that realization that he is sort of the straw that stirs the drink in a similar way. And I think the teams are more aggressive in their – Uh, efforts to double team him or get you know have two guys on him at all times so you combine all that stuff together and I think you're inevitably in a position where you're going to struggle I still haven't moved off of the offensive line points and I think you know you're right Connor it's surprising that with the pieces that they have they're not playing at a higher level especially with the head coach having been an offensive line position coach but it doesn't seem like Mahomes is entirely comfortable. And one of the common threads between the Super Bowl and so far this season is just Mahomes like scrambling and dancing around and trying to make something happen. And you can't rely on that. Uh, You know, he'd done it so many times that it made it look easy and that it could feel like, or it could be for a time an essential part of their offense. But when those you know, desperation plays aren't working, then you get into a tough spot. And, you know, I don't know if there's a lack of sync, you know, synchrony between Mahomes and the line, or if he's still feeling like he has to scramble around and try to make these desperation plays because he doesn't have much time to do anything else. I mean, one of the plays that stood out to me was the Bud Dupree speed rush right past Orlando Brown. And uh, I believe Mahomes lost the ball in that play, but the Chiefs recovered it. And like, those are the kind of examples that make it hard for the Chiefs offense to gain a lot of traction. There was that interception last week too. Um, Was it last week, right? Where there was that awful kind of like skyhook pop-up throwaway, right? That was intercepted. Yeah. Off the fumbled snap. Yeah. Yeah. And that was last week too. And what's interesting with Mahomes is, um, I think there are some there there's a valid point that I've heard on him in the in that there there's so many gifts, right? There's so many physical gifts that he has that I think that there are situations where he uses them when perhaps they're not necessary to your point, Jenny, where you're sort of floating and scrambling and maybe the play was just to get rid of it after, you know, your your heel hit the turf on that third step. And, you know, maybe there does need to be some Andy Reid West Coast you know, drilling at some point. And, but it's hard, right? If you're rewarded by that for so long, how do you, how do you kind of hone that in and, and develop as a passer and all great ones do, but at what point is, is Patrick Mahomes going to have to do that? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I remember talking to his throwing coaches and they mentioned that the idea that he can throw the ball out of the stadium literally can actually sometimes be a negative because then you, (laughs) just rely on the physical gifts and drift a little bit from the technique. So that was a focus of theirs. I mean, this was leading up to the first Super Bowl. Um, And, you know, I think when he got injured that year, it actually kind of forced him to hone those mechanics a little bit more because he had the knee injury. And so he couldn't use that same physical ability. He couldn't generate the same power. And that was actually good for his technique. So maybe there's a maybe a technical fix. Maybe he needs some time to work on. I don't know. I, I can't analyze this throwing motion on the fly. <laughs> Someone's just got to, I don't know, take a baseball bat and just smash his knee in and then uh, see what happens. That's not week. what we're suggesting, Gary. Mm. 
No, it's uh, to me, it's it's defensively that's just going to be an issue. I mean, they I don't know what answers you find at this point in the season because you brought in so many new guys who are talented with the thinking that okay, we'll we'll get them coached up, we'll get it going, and it obviously hasn't happened. But uh, offensively, the the biggest issue does continue to be the turnovers. I mean, this this game, look, this game was ugly. I think you throw it away in the same way you throw away like the Packers opener against the Saints. Uh, the turnovers have been the issue, and I just, again, I I will go down with the ship. I will continue to say the Chiefs are, I, I believe, still going to be right there uh, in the end uh, competing for the AFC title. Now they've, they've sort of made it tough on themselves because they've lost to basically, you know, all the teams who will be comp- competing for home field advantage uh, in the AFC at this point, but... They had not been negative in turnover differential since 2014 over the course of a season. They're minus 10 right now, which is, I mean, minus 10 is, is even if you're just a horrible, untalented team, that's really difficult to be minus 10 through seven games in turnover differential. So the other thing that sticks out to me is just the brand of turnovers they're having. They're just not, you don't want to just say, oh, bad luck every time they have a turnover, but, you know, it, they're not bad reads they're not okay our our offense doesn't work our, our receivers can't get open I mean their turnovers today was uh you know it, a bit of a forced throw Tyree coming back to the ball uh defensive back deflects it it gets intercepted Mahomes gets chased down uh Kevin Byard great punch out but like those are not the types of turnovers that you would say like boy we're, they're really prone to those uh they just they happen they happen to everyone every once in a while they're just happening happening to come in bunches right now for the Chiefs and I think it just it really just does fix so much going forward if those go away and you know you would expect the offensive line will play better Tyreek Hill seems to be playing through some sort of injury here that uh has him at a little less than 100% which I guess also you know is factoring into all of this but I don't think there's there's I, I don't know I I just I still I don't see it maybe it's just me I just don't see this falling off a cliff right now for the Chiefs. I think it's much more likely to uh, uh, to, to to correct itself for the next couple of weeks here. Our uh, esteemed writer Chris Ballard wrote a piece for Sports Illustrated this week about what happens when old people get old and try to still play sports. Um, I don't know if anybody else read that, but I don't I don't know why it reminded me of. Th- there is a play in this game on Sunday, and I'm not talking calling Travis Kelsey old. I'm just saying that. <laughs> But, like, he caught the ball and just, like, instinctively just, like, whipped it to the side of him and, like, to side, to back lateral pass, like, in traffic. And I just felt like like this was an example of, like, the Chiefs maybe getting too old to play some pickup basketball. Like, it was a successful play, but th- this has been their mindset for so long that they can out-athleticism anybody and do thing finesse everybody – and at some point, that's not going to be true, right? At some point, you're not going to have the full Tyree kill. At some point, Travis Kelsey is going to stop being able to do literally everything for your offense, and you're going to have to figure some stuff out. And I feel like we, we're we not there yet, but I feel like we're coming to the point where you will soon have to figure some stuff out. You're seeing a preview of what it will be like when we do get there. You don't have any trouble playing pickup hoops, though, Gary. Uh, I haven't played since the pandemic. Uh, okay. My last, my last game, uh, we won, uh, we we won our league title. Uh, it was just an incredible ride. But uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I will say that I did see some criticism of the Chiefs' pick of Clyde edwards alaire as like a luxury pick, running back in the first round. And while I don't think Edward Solaire's production has been what the Chiefs wanted, I actually think the pick was supposed to sort of be the counterpunch that if teams are playing a lot of cover two and taking away your passing options downfield uh, and a lot of your routes, et cetera, then you can run the football. And those are easier fronts or easier coverages, excuse me, to run into. And so the point about the run game not working this season and obviously Edwards Alaire got injured and there's been a lot of reasons why the run game isn't working but I do think that was supposed to be the counter punch and then if you're able to run the ball well then teams change the coverages they work off each other blah 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 it's uh it's a real shame for the Chiefs because they have the late bye this year 
And uh, I don't know. This feels like it would be a nice time for them to get a week off and sort of figure some things out. They don't have a bye until week 12 along with the Cardinals, yeah. who the Cardinals are probably happy to. Uh, Cardinals probably want to go out and play tomorrow. But uh, True. Well, they play Thursday, which is about the same thing. <laughs> and I bet they wish they had the Texans again. <laughs> Colts 49ers. All right, so I don't know if there's a whole lot to be drawn as far as conclusions off of this game, which was played in A, among A, under A, bomb cyclone. Who knows whether. In a, in a sounds correct. Okay, we'll go with that. In a bomb cyclone. So that meant lots of rain, uh, lots of sloppy football. We had seven fumbles total. Four of those fumbles were lost. Uh, two Jimmy Garoppolo interceptions toward the end of the game. And uh, in the end, a 30-18 to 18 Colts victory that, I don't know, I mean, it's good for them for going on the road and, and getting one here, even if it was kind of a, uh, I don't know, crapshoot of game. Just an odd, like, gross, sort of, you know, unappetizing game. I think, uh, you know, Sunday Night Football, we've gotten, like, back-to-back sort of just uh, yucky burnt dinners here. But that's okay, you know. Uh, you need a couple of those. Uh, uh, but, you know, it makes the good game seem good. But uh, big win for the Colts. Um, and just uh, – I don't know what's going on with the 49ers. Like, you know, we can't keep saying every year that, oh, they're injured and that's the problem. Like, you know, at some point that can't be an excuse anymore, right? They're certainly rolling up the penalty yards here. Uh, But other than that, just, I don't know. I I, I think, uh, well, I know Connor and I were in the same boat. Maybe Jenny was a little bit smarter than us, but... We were kind of, we were waiting for Trey Lance to come in and, you know, basically do something similar to what they had with Garoppolo, but now add this 11th man to the run game and it would just be completely unstoppable. Uh, No, I mean, Trey Lance didn't play tonight. That's part of the problem. But uh, no, this offense is just, uh, it's, it's good. It's okay. I, I don't know. It's, it's. Yeah, it's just mediocre all around. Yeah, Connor, you make a good point. It seems like every year we're talking about the 49ers being injured. I think one of those reasons is that Garoppolo has often been injured and also George Kittle has been injured. He was out tonight with a calf injury. But we were sort of waiting for Trey Lance to take this team to a new level and to be the answer to some of the frustrations that they've had on offense for the last year plus. But the way it worked out was Lance was forced into duty a little bit sooner than they wanted to because of another injury to Garoppolo, and then Lance himself got injured. And so this week it was a question of which quarterback would be healthy first. But right now, it doesn't seem like the 49ers are happy with either quarterback. And again, you don't want to put too much on the play in this sloppy game. I mean, one of Garoppolo's interceptions just kind of totally slipped out of his hand because of the precipitation from the bomb cyclone but overall it's just not the offense that we thought they would have this year whether it be Jimmy or Lance under center this is getting away from them another season as far as the Colts go uh I mean look they this is a team that's built to run the ball they ran the ball well in this game Carson Wentz continues to play moderately in control football. I think he's got to take the shovel pass out of his repertoire, perhaps, uh, because that seems to be a disaster. But uh, I think the most encouraging thing was, and and look, when you go over the first seven weeks of the season, you're going to argue that like Justin Tucker's 66 yard win in Detroit was probably the most impressive kick of the year. But I think when you factor the conditions in, and the, mm-hmm. I mean, the impeccable, ag- like, geometrically oh, split the uprights in a way that you rarely mm-hmm. see at any level of football. Uh, I think Michael Badgley's 42-yarder to make this five-point game in the fourth quarter in the elements, in the bomb cyclone, I don't know. That's, that's a bit of an X factor right there, if you ask me. Impressive that you managed to sneak that in. Um, I, you know what you do? You just move on, right? You, you don't acknowledge it. You just keep going. Um, but, I mean, uh, it, 
It was a good kick, Connor. We got to give Badgley and Gary kick. that. It was a good yeah. yeah. It was a fine yeah. kick. Um, I do enjoy, though, that Wentz is sort of ne- – now that Derek Carr has elevated into, like, good quarter, like, solid good quarterback territory, Wentz is, like, occupying that territory of, like, oh, how's that guy doing, you know? But, like, oh, not b-. And then you look it up and you say, oh, not bad. Like, that's Carson Wentz now. And so he's occupied that territory – very happy for him. Um, you know, some really physical runs uh, today. It seems like he's he's as reckless as he's being. I mean, at some points, you know, this is kind of, you know, a game where he can succeed, especially as crappy as the field conditions were. And so, I don't know. I mean, you know, he can always kind of bite you in the downspout of that roller coaster. But today, it all seemed to work out. It does. I get the sense watching him that it's uh... – Boy, the feel is still not quite there. He's a little bit like, you know, some of these screen passes that he's letting loose. It's kind of like, okay, that wasn't there at all. That should have been intercepted. Intercepted. You shouldn't have thrown that, and you should have realized you shouldn't have thrown that. But he's kind of like robotically going through it sometimes. Uh, But maybe that's, I mean, look, that's part of sort of rebuilding him at this point. And, you know, overall, the... The results have been good. 150 yards passing night, but he also, you know, they picked up 90 something yards of pass interference penalties. I mean, this is this is capable quarterback play at this point. Yeah, I was a little surprised the broadcast was gushing about Wentz and saying that he was playing as well as he had in Philadelphia, which one season was an MVP level. I don't think no. we've seen that from him. I think the biggest difference, honestly, um, from their slow start, other than the Colts turning to a diet of beef as Connor or predicted has really been Jonathan Taylor has been dominant. I mean, this was his third a hundred yard game in the last four games and they've had success when he's been successful on the ground. Falcons Dolphins. So there we go. The Atlanta Falcons stringing a couple wins together. They're still competitive. They're uh, they're proud professionals, and uh, they go out in Miami and uh, and get another victory here. But the story in this one is the Dolphins because of the quarterback situation and what might happen next. And we're kind of lumping these two uh, these next two kind of uh, kind of okay games. I'll say very nicely together, but. Uh, uh, we'll start in Miami where it's, look, it's, it's an offense. They have an identity. It's, 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 you know, they can run anything from an RPO to a run pass option in, uh, in this <laughs> offense. And, and to, in, in to, in to a of Iowa's defense, uh, you did see a couple of, you know, late in the down scramble type plays that did look like, you know, Connor, I, I, I know you remember this game. Well, the, the Arizona game last year, it was like, oh, OK, well, here we go. This is the number five pick the draft. And then it just hasn't been anything like that since you got some flashes of that. You also had just two really horrific interceptions. And ultimately, it's just it, it's like it's it's it, it's uh, it's long handoffs. I mean, this this should not be a turnover prone offense when you are. Uh, just constantly throwing the ball within, you know, seven yards of the line of scrimmage. But that's that's kind of the mix you're getting here, which is what the problem is. It is phenomenal to me how much how quickly the NFL figured out how to cover run pass options, by the way. Like I remember in 2018 when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, everyone was like, this is the play that's going to ruin football. It's going to destroy everything forever. And no one's going to be able to have any fun anymore, or play defense. And now like, you're looking at Tua, and it's almost like if you're the Dolphins, why couldn't you figure out a way to use that short to mid-range accuracy in a better way, right, in a different way? Because these RPOs now have such a razor-thin margin of success. And, you know, I was just watching a couple minutes ago a couple of these throws that he made against the Falcons' defense, which were phenomenal, but, like, only gained, like, four yards because it's a very well-covered run-pass option. It's, like, all this effort in order to just get, you know – um, a quarterback comfortable in a certain situation. But to your point, I thought there was some nice stuff on the run for him, but he is just, uh, just the, the vacillations here, I think are just too wild. And I just don't know what you want to do moving forward with Miami, but I still think like, I, I still think he's a win, a win with guy. Like I think you can at least make something happen there. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know what it is exactly, but I, I think if you reimagined it a little bit, maybe, 
Although after three offensive coordinators, who knows? Maybe there's enough reimagining going on here. Yeah, you know, I have to say I've been a little low on Tua, but I think he has shown some improvements between last week and this week. I agree with you, Connor. There were some throws that made me think, some plays that made me think, okay, maybe this could work. But there's a lot of things that are not going well around him. The Dolphins' issues are certainly beyond just Tua, and maybe there is a better way to scheme it up or better play on the offensive line or whatever the case may be. I don't think he's the main cause for their failures. Jenny dunked on my Tua take last week. and I, I did. Very, I've come around a little bit, <laughs> you know. Very, very <laughs> nervous in general about, like, <laughs> still espousing a lukewarm Tua take this week because I, I just felt Jenny, like, gearing up for, like, the grrr. No, no. I I, uh, I like what you're saying, Connor. I, I think you're right. There <laughs> no, you I, go. Look, I, I think it's totally fair. I, I, he, again, I, it sounds like an insult when I say it. It's really not intended to be. But, you know, Andy Dalton was a guy who was a quality starting quarterback <laughs> when he was surrounded. I know, I know, right? <laughs> Andy Dalton was a guy who was a quality starting quarterback when he was surrounded by really good talent. If I mean, that's kind of the issue with Tua. You're going to have to surround him with really good talent, but you can get a, a quality starting quarterback out of him. The issue is going to be, you know, you can't you can't put him behind this offensive line and, and expect it to go at this point. And obviously that limits your roster building ability. I feel like I just insulted. I, I insulted Andy Dalton. I insulted Tua. Mm -hmm. I angered mm -hmm. uh, Dolphins fans and Andy Dalton's fan club. And he really was, he was a, a fine starting quarterback. And honestly, I, look, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but if you are looking forward, I feel like we, we over the last two years, like reached a point where there were so many good quarterbacks coming to the league. There were so many great options. And that's what makes this sort of especially frustrating for the Dolphins and, and people who watch them. But, uh, maybe that's drying up a little bit. It's not a great draft class coming up. It's not one of those draft classes where you say like, Ooh, four or five first round picks. It probably looks like one, maybe two right now. Uh, Malik Willis out of, out of Liberty and, and who knows what else might pop up down the line. But we might be back in that spot where, you know, three or four years ago when you said, well, Kirk Cousins, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have Kirk Cousins. And, and I think that might be something that ultimately pleases people. And maybe, maybe, did, did, would that make people feel better if I said Tua maybe like a little bit of Kirk Cousins here? I don't think he's as good as Kirk Cousins, though. I mean, one thing I'm going to say, too, and Connor, you know, another point for Connor, but it must be hard to develop and grow and blossom in the situation that Tua is in, where every week he's being asked about trade rumors. And I know that's not necessarily in the organization's control, but it certainly is a little bit. And I get the idea that maybe if you're not sold on a guy after one year, like the Cardinals and Rosen, and they draft Kyler and... Things are looking good for the Cardinals right now. But, I mean, if you say he's your guy for now, I mean, they didn't use that word, but, uh, you know, the, the wording is always very careful that, you know, two is our quarterback. It's present tense. And I just don't think that's especially conducive for a quarterback getting better and feeling like the organization wants him to grow. I think we've all been in situations where you don't feel like the current environment brings out your best self. And I would say that certainly has to be the case for Tua right now. It is, um, it's, it's vintage Jetsian, right? Where like you probably go to work every day feeling totally insecure as a quarter, yeah. you know, like, you know, everything that anybody says to you uh, seems like you can't trust them. And then you have Gary over here saying, you know, relax, you're <laughs> going to be Andy Dalton one day. And or maybe Kirk Cousins, if you're lucky. That's horrifying. You know, I, I you know, so we're just I, we're all collectively Gary, especially, but also the Miami Dolphins <laughs> coaching staff not doing a good enough job of making to feel like you could do this. And I do feel like I don't know what it is. Like it could be an immediate reaction to their start this year where it seems like, you know, you won 10 games last year and you had to bench him a few times, which is fine. But that also stunted the development, certainly. Um, and in return, you got 10 wins out of it. But I think now, um, I think everybody's looking for something to blame because the rebuild is supposed to have matured. This is supposed to be the product of it. 
And now all the fingers start flying everywhere. And it's like, well, if I just had this, if I just had this, and he seems to be a very convenient person to blame. And not to go too off topic here, but there was a lot of conversation this past week about Belichick being too conservative. And I actually feel like he's doing what he can to protect a rookie quarterback. And until you're super confident that you can make those fourth downs and you know, Mac Jones has made some good throws, but he's also clearly still learning. And I feel like there's been a rush to blame Belichick conservatism when actually I feel like his quarterback of the, of the rookie quarterbacks is in the healthiest environment. They're basically not putting too much on his plate. They're moving him along. This isn't going to be their championship season. His long-term development is more important than anything else. And so I have a hard time criticizing that because I think it's a smart way to develop your quarterback rather than breaking him, which we are seeing, uh, you know, Justin Fields is an example. Mm. <laughs> we'll get to Justin Fields in a little bit, but first we're, we're going to East Rutherford for uh, uh, another uh, lopsided game this week. Panthers Giants. So yeah, this one uh, started kind of slow. It had a fun five to three halftime score, and I know that thrilled everyone. But uh, the Giants end up pulling away in this one. Ends up being a, a twenty-eight to three, uh, excuse me, twenty-five to three, even weirder score victory. But uh, uh, look, at the the focus, you know, kind of shifts. Uh, besides Daniel Jones's tremendous one-handed catch, uh, the focus kind of shifts to what the Panthers do at quarterback now. After uh, boy, a, a, another just rough week under center for this team and an owner who has just messaged in every conceivable way uh I want a franchise quarterback here yeah I just I still don't understand the evaluation that led to and the evaluation that led to Teddy Bridgewater is markedly worse than this guy like I just I still don't understand where that notion came from uh there was a point during this season where I think Sam Darnold was playing really well because there are certain things that he does really well, but I think that he has some flaws. And I think that once those get realized in a different offense, I remember he started pretty well with the jets. There was, I mean, his first NFL pass was that pick six in that game against the lions. But then everyone remembers they scored 49 points. I think in that game, he had like a long touchdown to Robbie Anderson. He came out of that game looking like a franchise quarterback. And I think, as the season went on, I think people kind of picked apart those those flaws and those things that he does not do well. And same thing happened in Carolina. You can't, you know, you can't out scheme that. I think Joe Brady is a great offensive coordinator. Adam Gase, people want to make fun of him, was a great offensive coordinator at various points in his career. And so I think that I don't know what you do at this point. I mean, you benched him. You said he's still your quarterback, but you have to figure something out. Yeah, I mean, we saw the early optimism with the Panthers wane in parallel to the early optimism with Darnold, and the Giants game was a great example of some of his old flaws surfacing with, you know, not smart decision-making. He had the intentional grounding in the end zone that led to a safety. He had a seventh interception in four games. That's the other flaw we saw, the ball security. It's so Earlier this week, Matt Rule was asked if the team would be interested in trading where Deshaun Watson. And this opens the door, quite frankly, to a very uncomfortable discussion that we have to address because it's going on around the league. If Deshaun Watson will be traded, despite the fact that there are 22 lawsuits alleging sexual misconduct against him, um, there have been a, a 10 additional criminal complaints and Many of these women have also met with the NFL. So it's very difficult to talk about this in just football terms. But the reality is there have been a lot of reports today that the Panthers and the Dolphins are the two leading contenders in the Watson race. And, you know, it's hard to know if these are being propped up by, you know, his agent or the Texans who would obviously very much like to move him or if the, the interest is legitimate. This has sort of been a long running uh, dialogue since the start of the season. But, you know, when Matt Rule was asked earlier this week about that, he said he had bought in on Sam Darnold. And, you know, if it's true that the Panthers are are interested in Watson, then, you know, Matt Rule is going to have to eat his words. I cannot believe that uh, someone else put it to me uh, perfectly the other day. If you trade for him at this point, 
having not come to any sort of legal conclusion um, and, you know, you are forfeiting the right to ever use like the term like leader of men for a quarterback ever again, because if the, you know, if the 10 criminal complaints, if the 22 testimonies, which, you know, and if, if this stuff bears out in the court of law and everything seems remarkably similar and consistent, like how does that play? And how do you convince anybody that, this is anything other than a nakedly desperate attempt to fix a team that you broke in some other way. And I I don't understand anything about it. I I think that the verbal gymnastics that you would have to complete in order to legitimize this publicly would ruin an owner. I think it would ruin a coach. I think it would ruin a GM. And I think it's a, just a dumb thing to do. So I don't know. I think if two teams are gearing up to do something really stupid, good for them, you know? It's two teams pitted against each other in just the the dumbest game of chicken here. Uh, and and look, the the reason you'd make a move is you're afraid the other guy's going to make a move before before he can. And then you know, oh, what if it happens? Uh, and, and look, I, we don't have to go too deep into uh, the Sean Watson situation. I mean, we have uh, Jenny has, uh, I mean, what twenty thousand words on it on the internet and. Uh, pretty much the entire thing still holds up. There's been no new developments. I mean, these are, and, and I want to reiterate this again, because people think we constantly just um, are are grabbing out of the, you know, uh, basically the, the public filings. I mean, we've independ- we've independently vetted the things that we've written about Deshaun Watson and his mistreatment of women. And, uh, you know, there can be a debate as to exactly where this falls as you know, as far as legality goes, it is a fel- is it a felony uh, in Texas? Uh, you know that that is kind of a gray area at this point. But he has mistreated women. I mean, that's that's the bottom line, and he has not really shown uh, any willingness to really say anything about it, let alone take responsibility for the actions he has done. I think there's a path to redemption for everyone. I think that includes Deshaun Watson. I think he'll play in the NFL again. But right now. Uh, the way he and his team are approaching this, and uh, they they're they're not going to relent. This is not going to be something where he he takes accountability this week and we start to move on. Uh, it's just something you absolutely cannot justify touching as an NFL team. So I, I don't know. You just shrug your shoulders and and just you know kind of uh, trust that this is a lot of smoke and there's nothing in the center of it, but it, people do stupid things. I guess that's the, I guess that's the moral of the story. And in the end, there are basically one guy at the top of each of these teams. And if he wants it badly enough, they mm-hmm. might go ahead and do it. And I think we should also just quickly take the opportunity to clear up a talking point. The NFL network reported this morning that he, if a team traded for Watson, that he could probably play immediately because the league would likely not place him on the commissioner exempt list because these are not violent crimes. Um, I think, first of all, the the description or use of a violent crime, um, I think we should be a little bit more broad in how we apply it. And speaking with some of these women, they did speak about it as a psychologically violent crime because of the toll that it took on them mentally. But beyond that, that's not the only criteria. You don't have to be indicted to be placed on the commissioner exempt list, which is the form of paid leave the NFL has. It gives the commissioner broad authority to do so. And one of the criteria criteria is if he believes that a person may have violated the personal conduct policy. And while in the past, the exempt list has not been used when there's only been civil lawsuits, this is a very unusual case because there are 22 civil lawsuits. 10 women have gone to the police. The NFL has personally spoken with at least 10 of them. I believe the number may be higher now. Also, in our own reporting, we've been able to get information that corroborates the women's accounts. Obviously, it's very unlikely that you would ever have incontrovertible evidence of a sexual uh, alleg- or a sexual excuse me allegation of sexual misconduct. But we have messages women have sent after or to Watson himself, um, and 
you know, I think also we should look at and consider the past case of Antonio Brown, who, when there was a civil lawsuit filed against him by a former trainer alleging rape, he was not immediately placed on the exempt list. But later that season, after that woman met with the NFL and also an artist who Sports Illustrated wrote about, um, and she alleged misconduct against him, and then he then threatened her via text message. She also met with the NFL, and later that season, it was leaked to several prominent media outlets, including NFL Network, that if Brown were signed, he would be placed on the exempt list. So... I don't think there is a good precedent. The idea that if they put Watson on the exempt list, that it would somehow break precedent doesn't really apply here because this case is unlike any other. But I do think the Brown case, that history certainly would apply here. Now, Brown wasn't placed on the exempt list because he wasn't signed that season. But it really sends a message if 22 women, actually more than that, right? Because, you know, there have been other women who have come forward. and I believe the tally is about 26 right now. If they share their accounts of sexual misconduct that closely mirror each other, right? The NFL doesn't put them on the exempt list. And by signaling to teams through their report this morning that they wouldn't put him on the exempt list, then that ultimately clears the way for a trade when all of these allegations are pending. So I think it's pretty problematic all around if you consider it under that uh, lens as well. Bears Buccaneers. All right, so the Bucks beat the Bears 38-3. to I know that from looking at the scoreboard, uh, and I also kind of know from looking at the scoreboard, the Bears still just, uh, they, they aren't even really showing signs of life offensively, which is, uh, boy, it's, it's just becoming a fairly frequent issue at this point. Uh, I think it sums it up perfectly, this game, that uh, – our, I have a, I have a three year old and she woke from a very long nap and just like walked out into our family room and this game was on and she looked at it for about a minute. And this is when it was like 35 to three. And she just said, I don't like this movie. Turn it off. And I said, <laughs> I feel like Matt Nagy probably agrees. Uh, there's probably a lot of people that feel the same way, but um, yeah, it was, it was a strange game. I think that we are starting to probably arrive to the, conclusion that right now in this moment that the blame is culpable on I would say like 70% bears 30% Justin Fields but like it's but it's bad on on all sides right like the protection is bad the checking to the protection is bad the play calling is bad the pocket decision making is bad the ball security is bad and so when everything is bad uh, you know, you have a 38 to three game against one of the best defenses in the NFL. But I thought it was, I, I, I don't know why I've started watching Matt Nagy press conferences out of fascination. Um, I enjoy his Philadelphia accent. And, uh, and so I watch it for that mostly, but he seems like a person that is just out of ways to try to explain this uh, to anybody. And Justin Fields too was saying, Hey, you know, after the game, there were some blitzes that didn't get picked up that needed to get picked up, which I thought was an interesting move uh, for a rookie quarterback. And uh, so everything seems to be going really great uh, for the Bears. Yeah, I thought one of the most telling moments of the game was when the cameras panned in on fields on the sideline and he was kind of slumped down on the bench and his face just looked like a person who was totally defeated. And Obviously, that's what you want to avoid with your rookie quarterback. You don't want to break them down. You want to have them enter in a situation that is favorable. And, okay, I understand that Matt Nagy had said he wanted to wait to play Justin Fields and maybe probably played him a little earlier than he had planned due to Andy Dalton's injury. But, you know, then he made him the starter. And I just think there has to be some questions among the organization and the coaching staff about how we got to this point where we're putting – our number one pick in it into a game in a situation where it's not great for him. So, you know, could there have been better preparation and practice and why is the roster around him not better? I mean, Ryan Pace has now had two cracks at the quarterback, but you're putting your new quarterback in behind an offensive line that has not been good. So I just, 
don't think it's a great look for the Bears organization all around. And, you know, while I remember well, Connor, the body language fines that were once instituted for Mark Sanchez when he was a young Jets quarterback, um, you know, you can kind of understand Fields' frustration. And, you know, obviously he just had his fifth turnover of the game, which not great, um, and was just kind of looked like a guy who didn't want to be there. But, you know, there was a lot of reasons where it, you could understand why maybe he wouldn't want to be in Chicago right now. Can I just say though, you know, it did look great and I'll, I'll move on immediately after this because you're both going to want me to. But um, <laughs> speaking of sideline shots, Andy Dalton's new beard. Wow. Like it looks like if you, if you wanted a red haired guy to play like Bradley Cooper's character in a star is born. Like that's, that's who you're casting right there. Andy Dalton, like he looks fantastic. Um, and I'm just, gonna, I'm going to segue from that to just, uh, uh, anything else, but, uh, I mean, I, maybe you're trying to elevate <laughs> Gary's to a anti Andy Dalton comparison I, I, by I, praising. I, him. Yes. I you feel like there. this is a political move. He mm-hmm. saw an opening to grab the Tua faction <laughs> and right. the Dalton faction in the yeah. same show. And Eddie, he, he, he did it. I mean, look, mm-hmm. that's how you win elections. I'm, take, I'm taking it one small county at a time. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know what you would want. I, like there was some, there's some strange stuff going on here, right? Like there was, um, this was the second week in a row. I think that field said that he was radioed in that he had to throw a certain ball because there were 12 men on the field. And so, um, and, and the throw ended up resulting in something not good happening. And so, it seems like there's miscommunication from the sideline. Either they're not seeing something or they're upset that Fields isn't seeing something, which either way is bad, right? If you're a quarterback, and I'm not saying that a rookie quarterback is automatically going to be Aaron Rodgers and pick up on the fact that there's 12 men on the field. Like a lot of things have to slow down for you for that to be able to happen. But if that's not even starting to happen, then that's a problem. And I think that if your coaches are telling you something that, forces you into an uncomfortable decision. That's a problem. But I will say this. I thought it was interesting that Tony Romo in like a quiet moment in this game, uh, just said, Justin Fields, Ohio state used to be able to just sit back there and throw it to whoever you want. And then like, just moved up, like let, let the dead air, like carry him to the next point. But that was like, you know, he doesn't like just drop random stuff in there like you know what i mean and i thought that that was a very interesting like uh anti-field sort of salvo there which is why i'm just saying that to, to my overarching point i think this is bad on both sides you'd blame the coaching staff more obviously but i don't i don't think this is going to a good place well let's uh go to a good place and that is the lightning round jets patriots Oh, the robot really threw me for a loop there. <laughs> that was not the order, and it really shouldn't throw me off because we're just going to hit these games really fast. But, uh, yeah, look, Zach Wilson gets his second crack at the Patriots here, and, you know, it's, he kind of said it would, it'll would it be fun to go up against it again. It, it was not fun, and uh, on top of that, he ends up uh, suffering what uh, it, it was a knee injury, and he missed most of this one, but it was kind of getting out of hand early and uh, very much was out of hand by the, uh, by the time it ended. And yeah, Gary, the whole point of this season has really been to have Zach Wilson develop. They've kept him in there, even when he's thrown a lot of interceptions. Uh, Basically, they want to ride with him, let him work through the mistakes. So any kind of injury is bad, obviously. And it's unclear at this point how long it will take him out. He told reporters after the game he thinks it's a PCL injury. Uh, We'll have an MRI tomorrow. And hopefully it's not season ending. Um... But yeah, it's it's it was just a bad day all around for the Jets. I would say in Zach Wilson's defense did a cool flip thing. I don't know if anybody uh anybody else caught that. Did anyone see the cool flip thing? He did a cool flip thing. So mm-hmm. um that was neat. You know, I think if if that's it, you know, for the year you get you play the cool flip thing, you know, a couple times, and that's good. But um it's a weird thing because there's some games where this Jets team which is obviously bad, right? And, and it's bad from a personnel standpoint. I think they knew it was going to be bad. I think that's why you trade up to get someone like Elijah Vera Tucker just to like, 
I don't think you normally philosophically do that for an interior offensive lineman, but you're so worried that it's going to be bad that you want to patch things as much as possible, you know, and, and just get through the year while you can sort of build it up talent wise. But it's just strange that this team possesses the ability to punch so far above its weight class some weeks and then get rolled other weeks. And, um, you know, I, I'm talking about the Tennessee game a couple weeks ago and how, how well they were playing there and how inspired they seem to be playing. Um, we saw some of those Zach Wilson throws that people fell in love with during, you know, his pro day, during his BYU year, you know, during his best season at BYU. Um, but then they just sort of disappear. And I guess that, that could just be the Patriots. That could just be Bill Belichick um, and his vintage game planning. But uh, it's, it, I think it's tough to, it's tough to lose to this team in that fashion both times this year. Like I think if you were Robert Saul, you probably would have liked to have come out of this year with one tight Patriots game. Eagles Raiders. All right, so the Raiders move to 2-0 and post Gruden here. And look, the final in this one is 33-22. It was not nearly that close. This one was over by the time the fourth quarter rolled around. Uh, and this was, again, just it's just a really impressive performance uh, by this Raiders team on both sides of the ball for a second straight week. Maybe not a world-beater opponent, but, uh, you know, the good teams beat up on the bad teams. Yeah, and they did it without Darren Waller, who was inactive for the game. They lost Josh Jacobs during the game to a chest injury. So I think it's really impressive how the Raiders have been able to continue to move forward. And we talked about it a little bit last week, like what that might say, that they've just sort of been able to rally. But really an impressive win that keeps them very much alive in the AFC West race. Yeah, I mean, I think we all drew it up this way that obviously the the Raiders would be contending for first place in the division and the Chiefs would be um, tied for last. And, uh, you know, uh, John Gruden would, would no longer be coaching the team exactly how we all drew it up at the beginning of the year. But, Der- you know, we said it before. I mean, Derek Carr's playing maybe his best football yet. And it's weird that, you know, he, as- he, he ascended quickly, right? He had a good uh, first couple years in the NFL, established himself as, as a worthy starter, I think had that sort of plateau period, but it's very rare to see a quarterback sort of then reascend in that sort of early thirties period uh, of his life. And I think that's why maybe some people had written him off. Maybe he was, that's why he was mysteriously um, that M effort to Tom Brady. Um, But now uh, certainly playing like Tom Brady would have to put a different inflection on it, right? He's not that M effort. He's, he's that M effort right there you know <laughs> and that's why i say it was an impressive win right because he didn't have all of the pieces around him and certainly they're in a tough situation they're still dealing with the fallout of everything that gruden said and the team having to move forward so maybe you wouldn't normally consider a home win against the eagles impressive but under these circumstances i definitely think it was do you embrace that by the way like i, I we we have a former editor right who runs a catchy t-shirt slogan business right and do you make the Derek Carr shirt where you're pointing at yourself and saying that mf like you're like that's me i'm i'm the mf mm. you know yeah you but could follow like the lizzo right now the lizzo so- merchandise 100 percent that b you know that <laughs> mf you know i don't know um you'd have to really be willing to market yourself around a ugly swear word lion's rams yeah, I don't know. This is still just not right that the Lions are winless. Uh, they go out to Los Angeles, and this was this was close. I mean, they, they, they definitely. I'm not going to say they were better than the Rams. I mean, they were clearly the inferior team. But you know, they get two successful fake punts, two successful fake punts in one game, and uh, and they still end up going down in this one. Jared Goff had a couple of nice moments, but also threw just a a back breaking red zone interception on uh on sort of their last chance drive but they're they're hanging in they're competitive this is an nfl team and a successful onside kick i mean i liked the mentality that dan campbell went in with that he was just going to empty the bag of tricks i mean he knows he's working with a roster that is inferior to every roster in the league except maybe the Texans. I'm not sure which one you would rank for last place in the league. But the Lions roster is pretty bad. So he knows that in order to try to generate a win, he's got to try a lot of things. So the fact that they 
hung in with the Rams, who have one of the best rosters in the league. And like you said, Gary, the backbreaking interception for Goff, it, it wasn't really over until that happened. Um, but I like Campbell's style. Um, I think that they could be good in the future, but they're just not going to be good with this roster right now. Here's how confident Dan Campbell has his Lions players, which is incredible in a game against like the best team in the league. DeAndre Swift scores that on that super long screen pass to go up early in the game. And he's doing this. He's shushing everybody in the stands. And I was like, you guys are about to lose by like four touchdowns. And I love just the pure attitude oozing out of this team. They're just like, uh, I didn't think that, like when I first heard the knee but- kneecap biting thing, right? Like I think I was like everybody else and I was like, mm-hmm. this is like a borderline turd thing to say, right? And this is going to be a turd team. But I love them. Like I love, mm-hmm. it's like, it's such a lovable bad news bears, Walter Matthau kind of vibe. Like it's very cool. And I, I, I enjoy watching them every week. Just to be clear, I, I, I think Dan Campbell would frown upon anyone who bit a kneecap during a game. I think it was just sort of a, a, a seemed like more of a metaphor. Washington Packers. All right. So the Packers go to Washington. Uh, they end up winning this one 24 to 10. I, this game pretty much unfolded uh, as expected here. I, I, I mean, look, I will say, you know, Washington did not implode defensively, which is something we've seen them do repeatedly this year. Uh, that's, I don't know, it seems like a positive. I thought the front four early in the game, I was going to write a little note in the freak out that the front four had responded to bulletin board material from Gary Gramling, and <laughs> they were, you know, keeping the Packers, or excuse me, keeping Washington in the game. They were, they had a pass deflection, they had some sacks, some good pressures, and I was like, all right, they're, they're playing okay. But, you know, here's what I want to discuss is how it if somehow escaped me that the Packers had not stopped any team in the red zone entering this game that they had let their opponents score on every red zone possession. And then in this game, they stopped Washington on all four of their red zone possessions. So whatever adjustments were made seemed to be working. Fascinating law of averages right there. <laughs> we Gary are, Grambling loves oh the law of average. We are not adding another hour to this show <laughs> as we have one game to go. But uh, yes, that's a, it's a very volatile stat and people don't understand that. When I tell people like, ooh, like, oh, they're already like, you know, first in offensive red zone efficiency and second in defensive red zone efficiency. That can't, you know, that's going to regress us. Like, no, it just means they're great. You know, like all these, I have a bunch of fans of one team because I pointed out they've recovered 80% of their fumbles this year. And, uh, all, you know, I'm like, well, that's not sustainable. Everyone should hover around 50%. It's just a matter of where does the ball bounce and who happens to fall on it. That's not a skill. And, like, all these people, oh, no, it's because they want it more. They give 110%, not like those other guys. Oh, I am going to add another hour to the show. Connor, add it to the list. We're also a pro-law of averages podcast. Mm-hmm. Pro-law of averages. Got the it. small sample size stats they all regress. People need to realize that. This is not like, there's no like Alabama versus, uh, I, I don't know, what's a bad school? UConn. Prairie View A&M. Yeah. Those matchups don't happen in the NFL. It's too evenly matched. The small sample sizes will even out. Okay, I get that. And I could tell that you were grimacing when I brought up the red zone point. So now I understand <laughs> no, why. And I should have no, anticipated no, no, this, no, but it is, it is remarkable. They didn't even have a single stop. Like, it's not like they just had a bad percentage. It Their opponents were, you, yeah. It tells you they're going to be better defensively as the year goes on. That's a great okay. stat. It okay. just doesn't mean what people would think it would mean. It doesn't okay. mean they're, they're bad at defense in the red zone. It means they're, it means they got nowhere to go, but, but up. If Gary was a, was a defensive coordinator. Oh, how fun would that be every Thursday? To ask <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that's Gary, right. To be not. like, yeah, it's, it's actually like the, the point he just made. Can you imagine the Packers defensive <laughs> corner being like, well, it's actually good that we only news. have one loss, but we've been so terrible in the red zone because don't worry, it's going to even out the rest of the way. Can't you tell? There are probably so many defensive coordinators who think that like, oh my God. And then instead they have to say, well, you know, Turnovers come in bunches, guys. You know, it's just like they thing every week. Um, two interesting notes, though. Uh, well, three. One, Taylor Heineke is still a very fun player to watch. I just want to throw that out there. Like, he is just like, 
very short, but also like interesting and uh, fearless. And I think it's just like a decent watch every the Sunday. Taxpayer, Connor, the taxpayer. taxpayer. Yeah. yeah. Like, a, you know, every every April, April 15th, like you don't have to worry about it. You know, right it's there. In, you know, it's in the mail. And uh, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers. I still don't get this. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, I don't think I've seen him have this much fun in a long time. Like there were like these, even when it was like nothing, nothing, he was like picking up like little scrambles. Like, you know, he like slid for a first down and then got up and did like one of these. And like, he was just like making goofy faces. And then after the game told Pam Oliver, he loved her, uh, which I thought was like, you know, just like a strange thing to do, but like seemed all like jovial and, but the one interesting thing was everyone keeps telling him after these games, not pretty wins, Aaron, but wins. And like, there's some expectation that the Packers offense has to also be beautiful. And uh, he said that's on the coaches to figure out, which I thought was interesting. And then we just trot into the tunnel after that. And he just doesn't care anymore. It doesn't matter what he's saying, but you know, you point up there and you say, that's up to them to make it beautiful. It doesn't, you know, not my problem. And then, just walks out and like what a freeing and liberating experience it is to just watch that guy exist right now. It's, it's just, it has to be amazing. Texans Cardinals. So we're not going to talk a ton about this game, except I will point out as a Baltimore Orioles fan, I'd love to have like an in season exhibition between my major league team and my triple a team. Like the guys who are going to come up and play for the, or- for the Orioles soon and sort of get a glimpse at them. But uh, that's kind of what this felt like. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins and J.J. Watt going up against a bunch of guys who just uh, uh, look. Uh, we we say it about the Lions. It's also I think it holds true with the Texans. They play hard. Uh, they just this this to me is the most undermanned team, especially after you know the the veteran Whitney Merciless and the, and the guys they've moved on from uh, recently. But boy, I, I I still can't believe they won a game this year. Yeah, I, well, I can believe that they beat the Jaguars, right? Um, but the Cardinals are seven and zero; they're phenomenal. Uh, uh, and I'm just waiting for that moment when their kind of flaws are exposed. I mean, Kyler Murray is, you know, he's still a little exposed in this offense, and perhaps that is ultimately their their Achilles heel or their downfall if, if his ability to maneuver in the pocket at all is compromised. But if they go into if they take on the Packers on Thursday, which is short rest for both teams. It'd be really interesting to see what happens there. And they roll over the Packers. Like they've rolled over all these other teams. I mean, I don't know what else there is to say. I mean, I, I still don't know what else there is to say now. They've, they've met every challenge that's been thrown at them. And I, I had them winning six games all year this year and they're already seven and oh. Well, Connor, the MMQB is well established as Cardinal haters, according to Cardinal fans. I do think the stat that Gary Grambling shared in his football things on Sunday morning was very instructive that at this time last year, there were three undefeated teams, the Steelers, the Titans, and the Seahawks, and they combined for zero postseason wins, which probably plays into a little bit of our pause since we saw this last season. But this Thursday's game, short rest, which always adds another dimension of things. Uh, I'm really interested to see the Cardinals face the Packers, and I think this will tell us a lot about them. They already beat the Rams, and now they have the Packers. The NFC is clearly the stronger conference this year, um, so if they can beat the Rams and the Packers, you know, two of the conference's biggest contenders, and that will really say a lot about uh, who they are this season. Can I throw I, – I want to throw out three mind-blowing stats. Uh, two of them probably not very li- mind-blowing, but I've already built it that way, so we'll, we'll stick with it. Uh, specific to the Cardinals, not just the undefeated thing, but uh, the two things that sort of jumped out to me that was like, you know, you just sort of go, huh. Again, these are small sample size stats. They they have now recovered 20 of the 25 fumbles in their games. That's That's a possession per game. That uh, that they are gaining through fumble recovery skill, maybe they just want it more. Maybe maybe I had it all wrong uh, all along. Uh, the the second one, they are now five for five on fourth down this year. Uh, again, that's 
you know, small sample size. Most teams don't go perfect over the course of the season. The other thing I wanted to bring up, though, because I would I would argue, uh, I don't know if we'll stay at this pace. I, I don't think anyone can keep up this pace. But if Kyler Murray played 10 more games at this level, I think we're talking about literally uh, in the conversation of the greatest single seasons of all time. Uh, and I was looking at some of the splits because he's a guy who, over his first two seasons, really struggled intermediate, deep intermediate throws. He was toward the bottom of the league. I think he was actually dead last uh, in, in air yards, 10 to 20, his, uh, his rookie year. But uh, right now, on throws of 15-plus yards, he is completing, I should say, coming into this game, he was completing 67%. Uh, Drew Brees last season in a much smaller sample size because one, he was injured, two, he doesn't throw downfield that often. He is the only one who has ever in a single season completed more than 60%. So right now what Kyler Murray is doing as a downfield thrower is not only much better than what it was his first two seasons, it is historically blowing away every quarterback in the history of the NFL. So... Again, does does that keep up? Is that, you know, is it like the Rondale Moore factor is is changing how defense play them? Is it A.J. Green? Uh, again, A.J. Green, who was, uh, Connor, you've talked about this. He was the worst starting receiver in football by a wide margin last year. And now he's he's pretty good. He was like seven for eight on downfield targets uh, as a pass catcher this year. So those are the things that make me kind of go, huh. Is this ultimately sustainable? And the other thing that makes me kind of say, huh, is uh, I, I think Adam Archuleta was doing color in this in this game. And there was a play where, you know, it was a red zone play, completely broken play. Kyler rolls left and then he spins back and runs back, you know, 15 yards and circles all the way around and like weaves through a couple defenders. And it ends up being like a six yard gain or something like that on a first and, uh, and goal. And Adam Archuleta is just like Cliff Kingsbury really pushing all the right buttons here. It's like, yeah, that was that was Cliff, huh? <laughs> yeah, quarterback doesn't get any credit for that one on the broken play. But uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Kyler Murray is having a run right now that is better than I think any quarterback I've ever seen. And I would go so far as saying I think it's as good as any quarterback has ever had in the NFL. So basically what you're saying is the 2021 Cardinals are a true test of the law of averages. It is. And if they defeat the law of averages, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm rooting for. <laughs> the MMQB NFL podcast is Jenny Brettis, Connor Orr, and me, Gary Gremling. We are produced by Shelby Royston. SI's executive producer of podcasts is Scott Brody. Thanks, as always, to senior podcast producer Dan Bloom for the best notes in the business. Mark Mravick is emeritus editor of the MMQB, and Andy Benoit is the founder of the MMQB NFL podcast. Be sure to subscribe to this feed on FL Podcasts, and once you do, please leave a rating and review because it really does help other people find the show, which is also available on Spotify, Stitcher, SI.com, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. 